as I did the reporting for Gray Plains, I found all these connections between the Plains and Russia. It's just a sort of strange thing, but there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, plants that are out there came from the, the tumbleweed is a Russian uh, plant, uh, came from the steppes of Russia. There were a lot of Russian people out there who had, uh, Russian Mennonites who had come to farm the Great Plains who had been recruited by the railroads and brought from Russia. And then there were the weapon systems, the uh, Minuteman missiles were all aimed at Russia back then, <laughs> and vice versa. So it was the connection that went back a long way, and it just made me think if I wanted to do something, you know, again like Great Plains, you know, what what place would I choose? And so that Siberia sort of sort of grew out of it and it grew but, out of Great Plains. But it really but it really started with this model of coming into the country. Right. What was the model for coming into the country? Let me insert, there was one little thing here. When Sandy moved to Montana, which was 1990-something? I moved the first time was like 82. 82. Yeah. When he moved to Montana, and I asked him, why'd you move to Montana? And he said, because it's closer to Siberia. <laughs> <laughs> that was the second time I moved there, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And my thought was I would go from Missoula, Montana to Siberia, because you could then fly with just one change of plane from Missoula, but then Alaska Airlines got rid of that. Air Alaska got rid of that flight, but anyway. But, the, but there was a precursor to travels in Siberia. There were two. There was Great Plains. The precursor to that was coming into the country. When you set out to write coming into the country, did you know you were writing coming into the country, or did you Not think exactly. you were going to Alaska? I had a friend in the National Park Service who who went to Alaska, had himself transferred up there to study the possibilities of new parks. Um, particularly in his case, the result is Gates of the Arctic National Park, nine million acres. And he moved to Alaska when the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act was passed in 1971, I think, and uh, just went to work there uh, and kept coming back to for visits. Uh, and he would tell us stories about Alaska, and I could not wait uh, to try to go there and just just jump in. And I had no idea where it was going to lead. For a long time, I wasn't encouraged to go because William Shawn, the editor of the New Yorker, didn't want to didn't like the idea. When it, the trouble was that it's a cold place, and he doesn't like to read about cold places. <laughs> This is true. <laughs> this is a man who wore a top coat and sweater so, in the middle of July. He did. Once I had an idea to write about Newfoundland, he said, is it cold there? <laughs> and, and so anyway, this, this really, wasn't, it really was an impediment, but, but I just hung on for a couple of years, and I got to go there. And, but I, just, I went around and, and uh, met people and so on and so forth, and it, it grew. It, it was not a plan in the... Uh, when I went, I just did, I wanted to do work in Alaska, and in total, the whole project was three years, and that, but that's, it wasn't a, I don't, when you went to the Great Plains, you were planning to write a book on the Great no, Plains. No, I went out to, I went out to write a novel, and I went out and lived wow. in Montana, and spent like a year and a half just really working on a novel, and uh, finished it, I didn't finish it, I'd done about two-thirds, and I showed it to uh, my editor, Farrar Strauss, and she said this was bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of cutting to the chase, It really. was really, it, it hurt. And, and I gave it to my friend Jamaica Kincaid, and I didn't hear from her for like two weeks. <laughs> and finally she called me up, and she was obviously in such pain, and, finally, and she said, well, there are a lot of problems with it. And I thought, ooh, that doesn't sound good. And I, so I just abandoned it, and I, and I didn't do any more on it. And, mm -hmm. and I had thought before of doing this thing about the planes, but I wanted to finish this novel. So then I decided, okay, I'm going to do the book about the, the Great Plains. So I called up Mr. Sean, just speaking of not liking cold places. I called him up, and <laughs> I had at that point written mostly humor for the New Yorker. So I called him up, and I said, I want to do a, a piece about the Great Plains, a profile as if the Great Plains were a person. And, I'm gonna, and I told him all, you know, I want to write about all this different stuff on the Great Plains. And there was a long pause, and Mr. Sean said, would it be funny? 
And I said, well, you know, 50 million buffalo killed? I mean, yeah. <laughs> There's got to be some humor there somewhere. <laughs> the, could, could I insert? Yes. Would, when I went to him and told him I wanted to write about geology, he said, he, with a long pause, you know, and he says, well, all right, but readers will rebel. <laughs> <laughs> The, just, just listening to you reading, John, from this piece, uh, The Season in the Chalk, you, you had this, I, I can't even begin, Sandy and I are sitting backstage, and as you were reading it, I turned to him at one point, right before you got to the part where you described, uh, I, I got a, uh, 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 Doin Ditmus having gone to Deerfield with you. And I said, didn't, didn't he, wasn't he a friend of John's? And then you said, oh yeah, you'd gone to Deerfield with him. Now, that's, the fact that you, um, that you met this guy in uh, 1946, uh, uh, whenever, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you, and you decided that four years from then you would go to school together in England, and you did, and then, um, we fast forward a few decades, and there you are with him. That seems sort of predetermined, but actually, when the piece opens, you're out there with Tommaso, who has a, who has rocks, and he's doing something with them. And and and, did you know that you were reporting that day when you were out there with your grandsons? Were you consciously thinking this is a scene? I went the over piece? there to. Well, I mean, you know, there were a lot of things, but I I went there to. Um, see the Cretaceous terrain, the chalk, and uh, I, w in, I was doing it in, in, uh, with trips with, with uh, two daughters, actually, Martha and, 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 and her family, and I went over in, in, in the French and, and Dutch uh, places that, that I went to, and all, all that was planned. But I, I intended to do a piece of writing, yes, about the chalk, not necessarily after that trip. But that day, there's a notebook in your pocket. Oh, yeah, and when I went down with Doyne Didmus, I went down there for, you know, four or five, six days, and we, we hiked all over the South Downs and went up to Breaky Bottom, but the purpose was to do a piece. I had this idea for years in my mind about, about writing about uh, some formation like that, and also the stuff that goes on on the surface of the Earth at the same time. Um, when I was... Um Introducing Sandy, I was, I was worried that the crowd was uh, not appreciating how much I actually do appreciate you, Sandy. Um, not least because I often have said that when I got uh, to the New Yorker, I was not very well read. I, I, I was playing catch up and I was reading a lot of New Yorker writers and uh, just uh, voraciously and, and really trying to, you're trying, you're, we, were, we were in our 20s. You know, we were, you're really trying to find a voice and you, actually knew in a way that, that was spooky what I always thought was the most important thing a writer um, needed to know, which was what to leave out. You know, as you're trying to acquire, find something, you, you actually had figured out that stuff. And I, after reading you over the years, um, the two of you are the writers from whom, there's a couple of others, but from, from, whom, from whom I've learned the most, reading you I want to know what you two have learned from each other, because you have read him first. But I happen to know from many conversations that he is a great student of yours. Well, I started reading John when I was so when I was really young, and I guess I guess the thing you know, there was this sort of modernist period in writing where you weren't supposed to have any kind of plot or anything. You know, I mean. When I was a kid, in our town, we produced Beckett plays, you know. Our town was a very hip town in Ohio. And, and I was in a Beckett play, and I remember sitting and looking at the audience, and they just looked like they'd been hit with mallets, you know. <laughs> this was in Endgame. And I, I'm looking out there. I played like the main guy in Endgame that just sits there. And, well, everybody basically sits there. But, <laughs> but so... It was like that was what was really cool was was modernism that sort of um, 
rejection of any kind of comfort in this, or any kind of like story that you could follow. And I remember reading John's story about Arthur Ashe that was in however long ago it was in and just being blown away by he goes like with Arthur Ashe's genealogy and it goes back to Africa and he's I had never seen anybody do that before so that you're telling a historic story and a personal story and it was just so so gripping to see that done in a piece of nonfiction and I would say just parenthetically that it was before Roots and when Roots came out, I thought, you know, John has already done this particular interesting thing of tracing a genealogy like this from Africa to America, and it may have been done elsewhere before, but I had never seen it. And it was just the story of this guy, and suddenly it was as if, I mean, you didn't, you could have a story. And if the way to get to it was through the fact that the stories were right in front of you, or you know that you could seek them out in real life and in reality. There was just something you know really uh, exciting about it, and it was what you know it was what I wanted to do in in nonfiction myself. He was in high school when 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 I wrote that, and that, that's the thing. He I mean you know I would have felt that way if, if I'd been in high school and he was um, older. One of the things I learned from Sandy was what not to do. The, the, <laughs> the well, I'll tell you, Thank you. I've no, I'll tell you what I mean. Uh, you, there, are, there are certain writers that you, you read and, or read when you were young and everything, and, and you thought, just maybe I could do that. And then you read, say, Philip Roth, and you thought, that's really wonderful, I love that, but I couldn't do that. 